Hello, everyone. I'm Sybil Starr, and I'm here today to give the astrology forecast for the Scorpio new moon, uh, which I am calling Dancing with the Chaos of Creation, because that's what's really going on. So to begin with, I'm going to show you the chart of the new moon. Okay, here we go. All right, so the Scorpio new moon occurs on November 1st at 5.48 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and so what we have here is we have uh, the sun and the moon at 9 degrees, 35 minutes of Scorpio. Okay, now this new moon is in a trine here to Saturn, Saturn at 12 degrees of Pisces. Um, and the ruler of this new moon, of course, is Pluto, and the ancient ruler is Mars, and there is a Pluto-Mars opposition. Pluto is at 29 degrees, 44 minutes of Capricorn, opposite Mars at 29 degrees, 4 minutes of Cancer. The exact conjunction will be on November 3rd, but it's definitely, this this aspect has been bearing down on us and it's going to continue for the next several months. All right. <clears throat> All right. So what else have we got going on here? So what we've got is uh, Saturn is in what's called a T-square aspect. It uh, We've got Venus here at 17 degrees of Sagittarius, opposing Jupiter at 20 degrees of Gemini, and they both make a square to Saturn. Okay, two right angles. And so that that that's a challenging aspect, okay, as is the opposition here, okay. But we also have another wonderful grand trine that is also a kite. And so we have um, uh, Mercury here at 28 degrees of um, Scorpio, trying Neptune at 27 degrees of Pisces, trying Mars at 29 degrees of Cancer. So you come back, makes a trine, a triangle, and then this Mercury opposes Uranus. Okay. And of course, there's another one, which is Mars opposite Pluto. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Okay, so I think that's basically what we're going to be talking about today. And that that is a lot. All right, so what does all of this mean? Well, first of all, I always like to start with the archetype of the energy that we are working with, which is Scorpio. And so the the Scorpio, and we entered Scorpio, I can't remember what day that was. It's either the, tw I think it was the 22nd of um, October, 22nd or 23rd. Anyway, <clears throat> the Scorpio, Scorpio is about feeling everything. Um, it's, it's like Scorpio has come in to feel every human emotion and to feel it intensely. The key is to not get stuck in the emotion. So no, this, uh, and with, uh, you know, with this Pluto Mars, uh, um, opposition as well, there is a lot of intense emotion in the field. The key is to let it flow through you. It is a very healing kind of, we're healing the emotional body, our own emotional body, the emotional body of the collective. And so the emotions are really running strong. And it, Scorpio is very much about that old saying, it hurts so good. They can, those with Scorpio energy can carry an old grudge. And so it's about letting go of those old toxic emotional patterns that we hold on to and that we remember because they don't help anyone. You know, um, Scorpio is, um, is, is related to the Phoenix. You know, they say they, they come in like the scorpion, but ultimately they are to rise like the Phoenix from the ashes, totally transformed. And it's the emotional body that is transformed and is transformed through forgiveness. It's a very transformative and healing energy when we can let go of the old patterns. 
Scorpio wants emotional intimacy, wants that deep emotional connection. But to have that, it requires emotional honesty with self and with others. Okay, and that is the key to the emotional health. Scorpio energy is very passionate, strong-willed, and intense. And it rules the cycles of life, life, death, transformation, and rebirth. Okay, uh, Scorpio energy travels in socially forbidden territory. Um, my old teacher, Steve Forrest, used to call Scorpio in the eighth house uh, and that territory, sex, death, and the occult. And it's absolutely true. It's those areas, you know. All right. And Scorpio can have a very dark sense of humor due to that because it can really go into those taboo areas. All right. So Scorpio asks us to let go of what we no longer need. It's like the snake shedding its skin and especially around old emotional patterns. Shadow of Scorpio, it can be secretive, manipulative, jealous, and carry a grudge. Right. Okay. And you may not even know it. And the other thing is what I have noticed about Scorpio, they'll hang on and hang on and hang on. And, and then suddenly when they have the realization it's time to let something go, they like cut off um, connection. And so it might happen suddenly. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, on November 1st is the beginning of the season of Samhain, um, which is the ancient Celtic festival on that started on November 1st. And it marked the end of the harvest season and the beginning of the winter. This was actually the kind of the, uh, the end of the year. And the winter solstice is the beginning of the new year. And it's a time of celebrating our beloved ones who have crossed over. We call them our beloved dead. And so the veil is very thin. So it's a time when one can communicate much easier with those on the other side. The day of the dead, I believe, is on the 2nd, on November 2nd. So it's kind of that, you know, that time period. Now, the actual cross quarter, the actual exact day of the cross quarter day of Samhain is actually when whenever it is, is it's a movable feast uh, at 15 is at 15 degrees of Aquarius this year. It falls on, excuse me, 15 degrees of Scorpio and it falls on November 6th. It is the midpoint between the fall equinox and the winter solstice. It's a very magical, energetic portal. And um, and to know that the, you know, the ancient Celts, this was a, a week-long holiday, not just a one-day holiday. So it started on the first, but, but then it culminated on the cross-quarter day, which was determined by the Druids. They, would, they knew when this day would occur. And to just know that this is the time of year, I was a hospital nurse for many years and this time of the year with the veil being thin many souls cross over many souls that maybe have been hanging on but um it's they they see their opportunity and it's time to go and to just know that that happens during this time of year quite frequently okay now there is a wonderful fixed star conjunct this uh New moon is called a crew, A C U R X, and it is the brightest star in the Southern Cross. It is a bit wide. I think uh, it's at like 11 degrees, whereas the progress moon is at uh, nine, but two, two, or might be 12 degrees. Anyway, it's a two to three degree range, and, and it's very, uh, so it's very much in play. And like I said, it is the brightest star in the Southern Cross, and the, it brings with it the quality of divine love. Divine love being the essence that holds everything together. It is the 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 entire ent it holds together the entire creation of our universe. And it reminds us that the source of all creation is divine love and that we are that divine love. We are held in that divine love, not even held in it. We are made of it. And so to know that also there's a portal of, of, a, of remembrance of this about ourselves and each other that we are love, even in these challenging times. Now, the Sabian symbol for this new moon is, uh, and, and of the Sabian symbol, I'll, I'll just uh, repeat, uh, there was a psychic back in the 1930s named Elsie Wheeler who um, 
had a vision for every degree of the zodiac. And it adds often a layer of understanding and meaning. And so the Sabian symbol for these, this degree of the zodiac for the uh, new moon is a fellowship supper reunites old comrades. And I think if this has to do with the divine love and remembering the fellowship of humanity, that we are all in this together, we are not alone, we are uh, we are a, a, a fellowship, um, you know, as we move into the Aquarian age, you know, which is the age of brotherhood and fellowship and re helps us remember that. And I also believe it can also indicate fated meetings and karmic bonds. Those with whom we have soul contacts may show up during this time as well. Okay. Now the new moon, as I talked about in Scorpio is trying Saturn in Pisces and, uh, the moon and Pisces, excuse me, the moon and Saturn, whenever they are together, it indicates a level of emotional maturity and the, uh, a trine is an easy flow. So it's an easy flow of feeling and taking responsibility for our feelings. Saturn is always about a new level of maturity. And so the sun and the moon and Scorpio, both trying Saturn and Pisces, can provide reflection, stability, and a needed calm to the heightened emotional energies of this month, which, like I said, they're extremely heightened. All right. And this is why not only because of the sun and moon being in Scorpio, but because of the, the Pluto opposite Mars that is happening. Oh, I didn't mention in the chart that it's also square Juno. OK, yeah. And they're all three at 29 degrees. All right. So first I'll talk about Mars and Pluto. Then I'll talk a little bit about Juno and Libra and what that means. Like I said, it's Pluto at 29 degrees of Capricorn, opposite Mars at 29 degrees of Cancer, and they're both in a square to Juno in Libra at 29 degrees of Libra. All right, so Mars and Pluto are dancing closely together actually for the next three months uh, as Mars slows down and stations retrograde. Uh, and it does this on December 6th, at uh, six degrees of Leo. So a couple of sixes there. Now they actually meet three times in this pattern. The first and exact up the first exact opposition is on November 3rd with Mars and Cancer opposite Pluto and Capricorn at the last degree. And it's gets the anoretic degree, a degree of crisis, a last chance. We call it the last chance saloon. There's a pressure and a catalyst here pushing us to grow. Okay. But they meet two more times. Uh, they meet in Leo in uh, Aquarius. The, the first one is, is when, uh, uh, let's see, Mars is at, uh, Mars is retrograde at zero degrees of, um, Oh, it's one, I think it's one. It's actually one degrees of Leo opposite Pluto at one degree Aquarius. And then they meet again on April 26th and they're both at three degrees of Leo and Aquarius. So it's actually a six month event, okay? But the real intensity I believe is the first three months, okay? And so if you have planets in the late degrees of Cancer or Capricorn or the early degrees of Aquarius and Leo, this event could, event could be a particularly impactful. And also the houses, it's going to impact everyone in the houses. So whatever houses are activated will determine the area of your lives that are most activated. Let's just say I have it in the fourth, 10th opposition. So that would be... Um, conflict, but ultimate integration uh, between home and family, career, home, family, and career, and public versus private life. If you have it, like, say, in the first or seventh, it could be in person. This could go on in personal relationships, okay, self versus other. But um, all right. So anyway, so let's just go on. So Mars is known as the god of war and often brings conflict and turbulence into situations that are unresolved and asks for courage while showing us our direction in life and where we take action. Mars is always about taking action. 
But with when but when Mars goes retrograde is telling us to slow down and think think before we act. But anyway, November 3rd, it is not retrograde. It's the first act uh, activation. Pluto is the god of death and rebirth, the underworld, the deep unconscious. Pluto represents unhealed trauma and asks us to do some deep emotional excavation, which leads us to our greatest soul treasures. You know, Pluto was always called, was called the wealthy one because he ruled the underworld and it was there for all of the valuable minerals and, and jewels were found. And so it is really excavating and to find our own uh, wealth, um, our our own jewels, our own self worth is is often about self worth. Okay, anyway, Pluto asks for emotional honesty, a transformation of consciousness through the healing of the emotional body. Pluto says you have to feel it to heal it, and then forgive yourselves and others. Mars and Pluto, when Mars and Pluto come together, they can create a very volatile field with chaos and upheaval of all kinds, as both are actually the rulers of Scorpio. And combined with the increased solar flares and geomagnetic storms, it is creating a very emotionally intense field. It is like the storm, an emotional storm. We're traveling through a storm, but the storm that shakes everything up and ultimately clears the path so we can see our way forward. All right. On a personal basis, we may experience power struggles, a battle of wills with another that is really about a battle within your own self to align your egoic will with the divine will. And the divine will is our soul plan. Our egoic will is actually our free will choice. So it's actually aligning our, it's choosing to align with our soul plan. Okay. We may experience projections put upon us or the other way around. We might find ourselves projecting onto others. And since many of us have issues in expressing anger and aggression or dealing with heated confrontations, this, uh, this opposition between Mars and Pluto can be a challenge. We might ask ourselves how we can reclaim our power and assertiveness or express our anger in healthier ways. Pluto is always about power, self-empowerment, and showing us the ways we disempower ourselves so that we can make different choices, empowering choices. If we can channel our willful drives toward achieving a worthwhile goal under this Mars-Pluto aspect, rather than projecting the focus of power onto someone or something outside of ourselves, we can move mountains. Both have to do with our, both Mars and Pluto have to do with our desire nature. We can move mountains with this aspect, but the question is always, are we moving the right mountain? That is the question. Where is this desire coming from? Is it coming from a wound or is it coming from our own self-empowerment? Okay. Is it a reaction or is it actually just some, a deep desire? What are our inner motiv motivations for what we think we want? And when they are actually aligned with divine will, with our soul plan, our destiny is when we have the wind at our back and we move the right mountains. Okay. But it requires inner reflection to know. This as this aspect reminds me of the tower card uh, uh, in the tarot. In the tarot, it's, it's it's related to Mars, but I think most people agree it's kind of more Mars Pluto or even Mars Uranus. But in this case, we're going to look at Mars Pluto. It is the most healing card in the tarot deck, but can also be the storm. It can bring sudden change, chaos, and upheaval. Once again, the storm that clears the path. Ultimately, the tower card is a spiritual awakening. Pluto says evolve or repeat. We're being pushed to evolve because at, when we actually allow ourselves to evolve and break old patterns, we forge new ways. We can see the path. If we don't, we continue to repeat the same old mistakes that really don't serve us. It is a shadow clearing catalyst. This will this aspect will allow us to free ourselves from the limitations and restrictions of our own shadow, which are really our traumas. It is our trauma response to things that happened in the past but are no longer happening. Uh, and it's also the shadow of the collective. 
as we know, the external world is a reflection of the collective shadow. It is about the integration of dark and light within, and we will continue to project our shadow material onto others until we own it and then heal it and say, this is mine. Like, let's just say, you know, anger or whatever difficult emotion that shows up in our field. Once we own it and say, you know, this is my anger, this is my grief, this is my sadness. No one made me feel this way. It then takes you down into yourself to be able to, to heal that, um, you get tired of feeling like that and you want to want to change it and realize it's in your power, not in anyone else's. OK, begin looking at your fears as a reflection of what you need to see. Don't look away as you look fear in the eye. You will begin to see a transformation in yourself and let that fear transform into love. We are in the times of the great purification which is breaking our toxic bonds with the 3D fear control matrix. But to know that the only way out is in, we have to go within. The inner world is where we make the changes. And then that, then, then those changes are reflected back to us in the outer world, not the other way around. How we change our world is to change ourselves. Okay. Pluto is a slow moving planet, but when activated, it can be like a volcanic eruption a release that ultimately brings healing, but initially can bring chaos. And then when we add Juno in Libra, she becomes the focal point. And Juno is the goddess of relationship. And she, she really is seeking fairness and balance in relationship. And Libra is also about peace. I think it is about peaceful relations with others. And when we don't project our stuff onto other people and own our stuff, then we can have peaceful relations because it's not their fault. Uh, but to know that in the field, there is a manipulation uh, to project our fears onto others and to create divisiveness, creating an us versus them mentality. Now, we are in the middle of this very contentious election. And so I do want to share this great meme with you that I found because I think it's really uh, important. I think it's really powerful. OK. All right. Because we know this is going on the political divisiveness. OK. So political divisiveness is a weapon used against society. You have much more in common with your neighbor than you do with the people you vote for. And to remember that, that is the most important thing is how we treat each other. As we move through these challenging times, that's one of the, the key things. And I feel like the Juno in Libra is really um, uh, saying that as well, okay? But, and to find common ground, uh, like I said, we share more in common with each other than anybody in a position of power. And I just wanted to also bring up, this is the last time that Pluto will be in Capricorn for 248 years. Pluto moves into Aquarius on November 19th. Now we will have one more full moon uh, with Pluto in Capricorn, but that is the last for 248 years. And he has been stationing on this 29th degree, which is the anoretic degree. It's a really important degree. I've been going back and forth over it. And Capricorn uh, represents the structures that hold up our civilization. Pluto shows us where they are corrupted and out of integrity. And so I want to, and uh, of course, you know, like I said, we're in a very contentious election cycle, as well as, you know, we're very close to uh, a potential world wars. And I think it's really up to us and the field that we create to really keep it from becoming a, a reality. All right. But the Sabian symbol for Capricorn, 29 degrees, again, is directors of a large firm meet in secret conference. The anoretic degree will be in play throughout the election as the old paradigm is collapsing. Its shadow material is rising for us to see and feel and to know that what we are dealing with is also a collective response. 
Many secrets of our government, banking, and military are coming to light, as well as the dark energies and secrets emerging from the entertainment field. I mean, those who have power all over, there's this darkness. They've been meeting in secret for a long time. Well, that Pluto exposes brings light to the darkness. So there is tr the truth underlying many secrets are coming to light. And it's important to remember that we are still in the midst of our Pluto return here in the United States. Um, it won't really be over until Pluto it goes off of the degree of one degree of Aquarius, which will be, well, let's say it's probably one more year. We're probably still within range. Um, so Pluto is a, a it's a big reality check for us. Um, and some we may be shown some very hard and bitter truths about who we have become as a nation and our leadership. But when we can acknowledge it, we can make choices that align with the higher good instead of choices made in fear. All right. The Sabian symbol for 29 degrees of Capricorn, I, ca, excuse me, Cancer, uh, which is the Mars, where Mars is. I mean, I feel like it's it's super poignant is the word I would say. OK, so it is uh, the daughter of the American Revolution. And this seems to me to indicate the power struggle between the powerful elite and the people as we move more deeply into the Aquarian age, which is about the power of the people. It also reminds me of what our ancestors who founded this country fought for. They say it was a miracle that the United States Revolution was a success and that they actually had lots of help from the other side. And the reason for that is because there's a prophecy that the next enlightened civilization will be in North America. And in the midst of this Pluto return, there will be a death and rebirth of who we are as a nation as we move into a fifth dimensional reality. Okay. And to know that a revolution is here, but it is a revolution in consciousness as we move into the Aquarian age. It is. Okay. And of course, it's important to, you know, remember that the last time um, Pluto was in Aquarius, excuse me, the last time Pluto was in Aquarius was during the American Revolution. And so we've got a new revolution coming, but it is a spiral. And I feel like it is, uh, uh, it's, it's on a higher level of consciousness. There's, I just read Bashar say today that uh, uh, it's only going to take 144,000 souls to actually shift, to move us into the shift uh, in consciousness. And I believe that is true. All right. Now, we also have Jupiter at 20 degrees of Gemini uh, that is conjunct the star Bellatrix, which is at, uh, in, in Orion. And I'm bringing it in now because I think it's super important. Um, because Bellatrix, uh, for you, those of you who don't know, is there's the channeled galactic history says that oh, the Orion uh, had uh, became the epicenter of polarity consciousness here in the Milky Way galaxy. And they suffered millions of years of war. And they say the Star Wars movies were based on um, the Orion Wars. And this is a this is a quote from Bashar. He says, the idea is that Star Wars is representative of something that happened millions of years ago in the old Orion systems, where there was a lot of oppression, suppression, rebellion, struggle, strife, negativity, and fear. The idea, as we have said, is that there are many stories playing out on Earth to help us finish some of these old cycles. So the ancient Orion story is here, which is one of the reasons why intuitively and collectively Star Wars was created. To bring that back up into your consciousness so that you could process it, deal with it, and begin to let it go. So Star Wars represents symbolically your past. And what happened in Orion was the Orion beings realized, they came to the awareness that the more they fought the enemy outside of themselves, the wars continued. When they realized the most important battle was the one within themselves, the integration of the shadow of dark and light, that is when they ascended. And so that's part of our story as well. And as we stop our projections is when we will step into unity consciousness. Okay. 
and that is the fifth dimensional reality. It is important to keep your center and stay calm as we traverse the chaos of the breakdown, for it is out of the chaos that the breakdown, the chaos of the breakdown, that the new is created, the new is born. As I said, we are in the purification times when the end falls into the beginning. We are releasing the trauma of the past and moving into a new area, era of creativity. And when we allow, allow ourselves to feel our emotional trauma, it allows for the release and transmutation of that trauma into love. And that is the new beginning. And Pluto is still transiting the stars of Aquila and will be for the next couple of years. And Aquila is the eagle. And, you know, the eagle is the only bird that is the only creature that flies into the storm so they can rise above it. So we're being asked, I feel like Pluto in tra transiting through Aquila is asking us to fly into the storm so we can rise above it and see the bigger picture and, the, and to raise our vibration, to be able to, to fly above the storm, we need to keep our vibration high. And then not only can we see, then not only are we not participating in the drama, we can also see the bigger picture and we can see the future. You know, and these are stars of Aquarius and Aquarius sees the future. Okay. All right. Now some other important fixed stars uh, with this uh, new moon is we have Jupiter is also conjunct a star called Nihal in Lepus. And this brings something very significant um, forward. Lepus is actually the rabbit. But this is the uh, Lepus is, or excuse me, Nihal is a marker for the blue ray souls. Okay. Now they don't, the blue ray souls do not come from just one star. Nihal is actually a marker. Uh, they come from uh, many different star constellations. And so who are the blue ray souls? Uh, the blue ray star seeds encompass a vast and incredibly important race of beings. They are true empaths and healers, fully dedicated to transforming the broken or damaged into beauty and love. They are the feelers and harmonizers in our society, more so than any other starseed type. And they have had lifetimes of service, especially to the Divine Mother, Mother Mary, Kuan Yin, Isis, the Divine Feminine, and all her many faces. They're called the forgotten light workers because they are so involved in service. They are often not seen and often work behind the scenes. They tend to be water and air signs, Pisces, Scorpio, Cancer, Gemini, Aquarius, and Libra with Virgo influences. They have sacred knowledge and wisdom. They're very psychic and intuitive, ultra sensitive, and can easily communicate with higher realms. But I believe while they are showing up now, it is about the transmutation of negative energy. Many blue ray souls, that is one of their primary soul purposes is to bring the light to tr and to transmute the negativity and the darkness into light, into love and into beauty. And and they do it just by their presence. It's not like a... a um, you know, something conscious. And so during this time of purification, if you are a blue ray soul, or if you relate to what I have said here, you may feel more tired than usual. Because and, and just by transmuting all of this negativity in the field into love and beauty, and to know this is going on. And that's the reason is there's so much in the uh, held as we break through this old matrix, all of the fear that has been holding it is rising up. It is rising up through us. And it's the blue ray soul's job. Part of what they're here for is to transmute that and to help us move through and release us from this old matrix. 
folks. Okay. But the thing is self-care is so important. It's important to take salt and soda baths, be out in nature, put your feet on the ground, give it to mother earth, surround yourself with white light and all of the different ways to keep your vibration high. And of course, one of the most important ways to keep your vibration high is to really live from the heart and to live from a place of compassion and loving kindness. Okay. All right. Now, uh, we have the, um, okay. All right. So then we have the, um, well, it looks like I missed something here. Oh, you know, I didn't talk about the actual square here. I want to go back and talk about the square. Okay. So there is a square, um, Venus, it, it we talked about it. Uh, Venus is opposite Jupiter and square Saturn. All right. Venus in Sagittarius, opposite Jupiter and Gemini, square Saturn in Pisces. And so I feel like uh, this is very much about the opportunity, uh, opportunities opening through love. Saturn and Venus always brings in self-love and self-esteem and an opportunity to connect with others expands when we love ourselves. Okay. All right. And so back to where the fixed stars. So Jupiter is conjunct Nihal. All right. The next one is Saturn is uh, conjunct Arshinar and Eridanus. Uh, Eridanus is called the uh, constellation of the river, and it brings stormy emotions. But Arshinar is actually a star that is about initiation into deeper levels of divine love. But we're doing this through the emotional body because, you know, we have, you know, love is the vibration, okay? And we want that we're healing the emotional body because the emotions are related to the vibration, okay? And Venus is conjunct what's called the great attractor. Now, some people call the great attractor a black hole. It's really not a black hole, but it is an area, a huge area in our Milky Way where there does seem to be nothing. And the great attractor, what, this is the best understanding that I have of it is the great attractor is a gravitational anomaly suggesting a localized concentration of mass, millions of times more massive than the Milky Way. The great attractor has so much pull, it draws thousands of the surrounding galaxies towards it, including our own Milky Way. This point magnifies our divine presence, enabling us to attract and align with cosmic events and opportunities that fulfill our highest potential. So what I feel like what this is saying here, this is pulling us toward this direction of love, this initiation process, as we are uh, transmuting our field into love. All right. We have the grand water trine of Mercury and Scorpio, trine Neptune and Pisces and Mars and Cancer. And a grand water trine brings with it an easy flow of emotions and heightened intuition and psychic gifts. Now, as I said, this grand trine is also um, a kite, which means that it there's planets uh, opposing these points. And so Mercury opposes Uranus and Taurus. And that to me is about the instinctual wisdom of the body. And Mars is opposing Pluto, which is really about our self-empowerment and aligning with our soul purpose, our divine plan, our blueprint, not only as individuals, but as a collective here on Mother Earth. So altogether, I feel like it is bringing forth new creative ideas and solutions. Now, uh, you might wonder what is behind me. It's a beautiful image. It is an image of a star being born. And so this is what I want to end with. I've got this beautiful quote here. Uh, Nietzsche said, one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. And from Plato's mirrors, what the, this is an interpretation from a site called Plato's mirror. And I really like it. And it says this quote of Nietzsche's 
encompasses a deep insight into the human condition and the creative process. The quotes suggest that embracing chaos and inner turmoil is essential for the emergence of new ideas, passions, and achievements. It signifies the transformative power of chaos, the ability to find beauty and purpose within the disarray of life. It encourages individuals to embrace the complexities within themselves, harnessing the chaos as a catalyst for personal growth and creativity. So as we navigate the complexities of our lives, let us not shy away from chaos, but welcome it with open arms. Let us dance amidst its swirling rhythms, embracing the inherent uncertainty of existence. For in chaos, we can find the seeds of growth, the birth of a dancing star, and the infinite possibilities that lie within. So amid the chaos, let us dance with creation and give birth to a dancing star, which is our own true divine nature. All right. Wishing you all a wonderful month. We know it's going to be exciting. <laughs> Keep your center and know that we are dancing in the chaos of creation. All right. So wishing everyone, like I said, a wonderful month. Namaste. And if you are interested in a reading, uh, please check my description box for my information. And please check like and subscribe if you like this video. All right. Blessings to all and namaste.